Hello, everyone. I'm Peter Freer. I am founder and CEO of Play Attention, and I'm delighted you're here. Obviously, we're going to study the role of executive function as it relates to academic achievement. And before we begin, as I do every webinar I do, I really would appreciate it if you would turn off your cell phone or put it in an airplane mode, turn it over, don't have it in your hand. And there is a reason I'm asking you this, two primary reasons. One is that I would like to have your full attention so that we can learn about what uh, executive function is and its role in academic achievement. But the second one I'll disclose to you as we go through this, because it's really important, and I'll tie it together with executive function. I'll tie together your cell phone use with your child's executive function. And I hope that's enough of a teaser so that you will turn off your cell phone, or at least mute it and turn it over. You're probably here because you have a child that is very bright and creative. And then while you have that child, you wonder, why is my child failing? And I totally understand that. I mean, that is the huge predicament that we often are in. It's a paradox, isn't it? A conundrum. And that we have a very bright uh, child with a lot of potential. And we see those. We see flashes of them. They're not there consistently. We see this. And then we wonder, you know, why is that? Why is it that we don't see progress in education? So what we'll do in this webinar is explore what executive function is, how it affects learning, and what you can do on your own as parents and educators and professionals here to help foster uh, you know, strong executive function. So I'm gonna give you the technical version of executive function, and I know we're all here from uh, some of us understand what executive function is. Some of us don't have a clue what it is. And some of us are, have partial knowledge. So I'm going to explain it briefly, but then I'm going to bring it down in the next couple of slides into something that's more relatable and should resonate within you too, as well as the technical version here. So executive function is rather a, a set of mental skills or processes that allow you to complete uh, tasks. It's not just complete tasks. That's so it's really so that you can live a life, a functional life. And ADHD, many of you have ADHD children, I understand. And executive function is a big problem for ADHD children. And that typically, as Dr. Russell Barkley said, who is probably one of the foremost uh, professionals and uh, healthcare providers that uh, has explored and investigated what ADHD actually is. ADHD is actually an executive function problem. So working memory is weak, typically. Working memory is my ability to store memory in short term, but then manipulate it. Uh, emotion regulation is very weak, typically. Uh, there is a good probability that you experience outbursts or uh, some type of anger issue, defiance issue that you have no idea uh, where it emanates. Mental flexibility, the ability to change my direction when I need to, to understand and, and easily do it is very, very limited as well, typically. Self-monitoring, the ability for me to understand where I'm going wrong. And to fix that, if I have ADHD, very weak typically. Task initiation, if I try starting a task, you know, and this happens uh, clearly in adults with ADHD. You'll start 50 tasks and you'll finish none. If that resonates, you can raise your hand because I know a lot of you have those problems and you start to see it in your children as well. Organization and prioritization are also very, very difficult and that we have an inability to meet schedules, to stay organized enough to learn things or complete tasks. And I don't even know how to prioritize them. It just seems to elude me. That's also a problem. Inhibitory control. 
impulsivity. And I'll talk to you more in depth about these as we move forward. Now, that's the technical aspect of it. Let's try to put it together in a way in which you can rather understand it more um, in a functional aspect. If you think of your, your brain <clears throat> as your the all of the parts of the brain, as the executive function requires all of these distinct different processes. And those are associated with the brain in certain regions of the brain. In order for them to all function well, they need a good conductor. So think of executive function like this, and this is a very easy way to understand it. Think of the parts of an orchestra. If you've ever been to an orchestral event, a concert, and the conductor's not out on stage, and you've lis you're listening to the orchestra, it's very noisy and very chaotic. Some different parts of the orchestra, the winds section, the horn section, uh, the percussion section, the uh, the uh, are all practicing their music or they're tuning their instruments, practicing pieces, and it just sounds like a cacophony. Now, if you think of your brain much the same way, let's say that organization and prioritization are the woodwind section. Let's say that attention um, is the ability uh, overall to, to stay in control of this. And I'll, I'll relate that with the conductor in a second. But let's say that uh, um, my ability to self-monitor, that's the string section. And my ability to finish tasks or uh, you know, prioritize tasks, maybe uh, that's the horn section. So the only way that we can get these to function well is if they have the conductor. So if the conductor steps out on stage and taps the baton, everybody sits up, pays attention to the conductor, as he or she directs the orchestra, he directs those certain areas, woodwinds, strings, percussion, horns, he directs them. And when he directs them, they work together and they create beautiful music. Is that making sense? So the conductor can be looked at as it is the executive function in your brain. Now, if any one of those certain elements, if the woodwind section is weak, doesn't play well, <clears throat> executive function, the conductor becomes weak, does not able to coordinate all of them. And if multiple sections are weak, it's very difficult to get really nice music. So if we think of the brain as the, uh, as the conductor, the brain's conductor being executive function, the brain's conductor being executive function, then all of these certain elements come together. Now, you may see this happening in physical ways with your child in homework. And some days, your child is able to get right to homework and finish it on time. And you're thinking, this is wonderful. What a great day. The very next day, they can't even get started. And it's really nothing more difficult than the day before. Has anyone ever seen this? Hands raised. If any of this resonates, you can raise your hand at any time. Then let's say that you're studying multiplication tables and you're doing flashcards with your child. And he or she seems to understand it and they have the answers and it's driven. They take the test the next day and they fail or they get a very low grade. You know, like, how could you possibly not remember this? And you go over it again with them, and they don't seem to know any of it. That where they presented it the day before, they had it. Next day, they don't. And so I think the underlying facet to all of this is inconsistency. When executive functions are weak, we get inconsistent results. And it's frustrating, I think, as parents, and this may resonate with you as well, Teachers, parents, counselors, 
it's frustrating to us because we see that intelligent child there or adult or partner or spouse. We see them there at times and at times the wheels come off. And now you can see why, right? If executive function is weak or the elements that support it, then we get inconsistent output. We get poor, generally mediocre to poor academic performance, right? We even have trouble making friends at times, just even social skills. And this is all part of executive function. I hope this resonates. You can think of it even very simply like baking a cake, right? I have to have eggs and flour and sugar, and I have to be able to blend all of them together and I get cake. If I don't use them in the right amounts, then I get goo. <laughs> as much as I want it to be a good cake, uh, it just is not going to turn out right. So all of these elements have to come together. The conductor for those elements is your executive function. I hope this makes sense. And I hope it's easy to, to kind of put into context when we learn it like this. Now, what the summary of that whole talk on the uh, that executive function is the conductor in the brain it means that the abilities are there however the conductor that leads them is not able to bring it all together right because some elements are weak they're not structured well or the conductor itself cannot put it, pull it all together and that's what we need to discuss on, uh, today, right? So we were going to discuss how it affects education. We've kind of tied that in. Then, of course, we go into why this happens in the brain, which is what we just discussed as executive function. And now what we also want to do is, as we go through this, is to learn what it is that we can do um, to improve it. Where does it come from? How do we improve it? How can we foster good executive function and bring it all together. So when we are born, executive function doesn't exist much at all. Executive function is learned and it is learned through a variety of actions in our lives, experiences in our lives that teach the brain executive function. So we all have the potential to develop strong executive function but we don't all necessarily, we're not all necessarily able to do so. Just want everybody to know, right? It doesn't immediately just pop into our heads. It doesn't float into our heads by some magical spell. We have to learn it. And I'll talk about how we can nurture that as we have uh, more time and we go further into the webinar. Executive function is governed by and created by the experience we have and our genetics, our genetic background. Some of you may have relatives who have ADHD. In some cases, ADHD greatly appears to be genetic. So some of the way our brain functions could be genetic. Does that mean that we cannot learn how to increase executive function? Absolutely not. I'll give you a good example um, and how we learn differently and how the brain may be genetically predisposed in one direction, but we can change it to go to another direction. Some of you may have heard of Rafael Nadal. Rafael Nadal is perhaps one of the greatest tennis players in the world. He's been injured this last year, but tennis is a phenom. Absolutely phenomenal. He plays left-handed. He is right-handed. But his uncle, who was his trainer, said, everybody has a much harder time playing left-handed players than they do right-handed. So from a very young age, he developed Raphael's game using his left hand. Now, if you look at Nadal's left arm, his left arm is inches bigger than his right arm, even though he is right-handed. His left arm, <laughs> excuse me, his left arm 
is so much bigger because he's been training it for years and he has become a world class, one of the greatest tennis players of all time. He perhaps is the greatest clay court champion of all time. But it's because he trained it and genetically he was predisposed to being right handed. So if you have weak executive function, it's the same thing. You may have a genetic propensity to be uh, have weak executive function in impulse control or organization and prioritization, or just overall, the conductor is not doing his job. That does not mean that you are stuck forever. The brain is incredibly plastic. In, in other words, we're talking about in, in plastic being malleable or shapeable, moldable. That's one of the great things about the human brain. So we can make significant difference in the lives of our children or ourselves personally. You are never stuck, but you need obviously the right input to make those changes. Let's talk about that just a wee bit. So when we have ADHD, executive function obviously can be impaired. Stress can also impair us as far as being able to perform well. Many of you probably noticed that uh, right now, whether you're ADHD or not, you if, if you're neurotypical and you're stressed, you can't even think straight. It's difficult. Anybody resonate with that? When you are very stressed, it's so difficult to make decisions, make good decisions. And that's because stress affects our other areas of uh, cognitive skill areas, <clears throat> which makes executive function very difficult. So in, you know, even if we have anxiety, anxiety can also um, be very, um, it can impair executive function a great deal. Anxiety can also make us not function on a good level. Now, adverse experiences, trauma in our lives can also impair executive function. You'll notice that many people with extreme who have experienced extreme circumstances, life-threatening things that have caused great anxiety uh, and stress in their lives, carry it, their brain is reprogrammed and they have a very difficult time adjusting. Their executive functions are impaired long-term. Does that mean they can't get them back? No. It means they can get them back, but their brain has been rewired a little bit. And you may know people like that. You may have met them. I know many like that. I think coming out of a pandemic uh, I think coming out of the pandemic, we're all, in a way, have been under stress and anxiety. And we haven't, our brains were impacted by it. School children have been impacted by it. And of course, not being able to go to class has impacted them. So we're, we've all been developing, developmentally delayed a little bit. And here's what we call them, and this is the problem. We want to make certain that we stay away from this. But you, at times, you may have relatives that don't understand you or your child. And they look at you and go, you know, you know he's just kind of lazy. He's always forgetful. He's just not motivated. He just can't get out of his own way. And then sometimes you actually get the oppositional and defiant behaviors with that. 90% of children with ADHD have weak executive function. I'd say it's probably more like 99, but statistics are at 90% weak executive function. And this can be uh, mitigated and reversed, but you have to have the right programming to do it, right? Just like I discussed Rafael Nadal being a left-handed tennis player, one of the best in the world, who is a natural right-hander. You can reprogram, but it takes takes work. It's not, you know, it doesn't happen overnight, but it can be done. We've been doing it at Play Attention for 30 years. The indicators that your child might be struggling with weak 
executive function. Here are, are the ones that you should be looking for. And it's all related to executive function. If they have a hard time taking turns, they rush through work, they push other children out of their way, that's impulse control. Impulse control is very, very related to success in later life. For those of you who are familiar with it, you may have seen the marshmallow study. So has anyone uh, here? Raise your hand if you've heard of the marshmallow study on impulsivity. Wow, a lot of us have. Beautiful. Great. <clears throat> so you know that this has been studied for a long period of time. We know marshmallows, for those who don't know what the marshmallow studies were, uh, scientists, researchers essentially put kids in a room and a single kid at a, at a time, single child, and they would put a marshmallow in front of that child. Say, so if you can wait until I return, I'm going to leave for just a couple of minutes. If you can wait until I return, I will give you a second marshmallow, but you can't eat the first one. If you eat the first one, we're done with marshmallows. You hold off on eating it, you get another. And so they filmed the children as they were sitting there, and some just sat there and waited and had great impulse control. Others were, would lick it. They would pick it up and look at it and smell it and put it down and eventually eat it before the uh, scientists got back. So the scientists kept track of all these children over a length of time, who was successful, who wasn't successful. The ones that could control impulses had great success all throughout their lives, great academic success, great success at university great success at their jobs, and made more money. The ones that had poor impulse control ended up very frequently with lower paying jobs, criminal records, and things that we really don't find helpful going through life. That's impulse control. So that's something we have to look at, and that's executive function. Emotional control overreacts, and this may resonate with some of us um, here as well, and that we have um, trouble dealing with uh, just situations that should seem like it would be very mild, a very mild response would be appropriate, but we get an outburst, we get a thunderstorm. That's overreaction. And this probably would resonate with some of you as well. That's part of executive function, and that's called emotional control. Flexible thinking. Can I change directions if you ask me to? Right. If I tell you tomorrow, you know, I'll take you to the store so that you can get that thing you want. And all of a sudden something comes up in your schedule. And I say, I can't take you today, but I will be able to take you tomorrow. And they cannot adjust. Transitioning. And this is often where you see this at school up to about sixth grade, uh, they are in one classroom all day long. All their subject matter is delivered through one teacher, one classroom. But then you get to middle school and they start having to switch classes. They have to transition from one class to the next. And you find out, wow, this is hard for my child to do. They have a difficult time figuring out where to go, what to do, what to even say when they get in the classroom. It's just different. Even though to a neurotypical, it's not a big deal. But to them, it's very difficult. And that's flexible thinking. Working memory. That when you say, go to your bedroom, put your pajamas on, brush your teeth, get ready for bed, I expect you to be able to do that. You may notice that your child can't process auditorily very well. They don't hold things in working memory. And so you say, go to your bedroom, put your pajamas on, brush your teeth, get ready for bed. You go up there an hour later, they did hear you say, go to your bedroom. You go up an hour later, they're in their bedroom, but they're playing their Game Boy sitting on the end of the bed. Does that resonate? They heard that first thing. The rest of it wasn't processed. The working memory is not strong. Executive function. Self-monitoring. Can I do homework? I throw it in my backpack and I never look at it again. I don't even check my answers. And if I have the ability to uh, interact with my uh, friends, 
I don't understand after a while why I can't make friends. I I don't know, you know, they think I'm annoying. And you may hear this from other parents, you know. Jimmy doesn't want to play with him because, you know, he kind of gets bossy and he's pushy and he's mean. And you go, that's not my child. But they don't understand how their behavior affects other others. And that's self-monitoring. Weak self-monitoring causes these problems. That's, again, these are executive function elements. Planning and prioritizing. This is really obvious. And if you're an adult and you have ADHD, you absolutely understand what we're talking about here. I can start a project at work. I don't really know what's important about it, what, what I have to do first, how to get from A to Z in the project. Don't really know. I'm guessing my way through it. And it gets so difficult that you don't complete it. So I will start 50 projects, but I finish none of them. And my employer is livid with me most times. And to me, I don't really understand it because my planning and prioritization just are very, very weak. Now, I may try certain things. I, I may try reminders. I may try a calendar. But if my planning and prioritization are weak, I may start that. I may use it a couple of times and then... I just abandon it because I don't have any planning and prioritization. I don't even plan to use those things later. Does that make sense? Some of you I know absolutely are here because this is a problem. Thank you. I appreciate you being honest. No one can see that you're raising your hand except me. So I do see it. And I know this resonates because, you know, I've worked with uh, ADHD folks for, for 30 years now. Task initiation is also a big problem procrastination let's put it off does your you see it in your child do they put things off to the very last minute till they're under so much stress that it becomes a nightmare if you're sitting with them working on this project and it's due tomorrow and why did you wait till today to get this started and then it turns into a fight and the, you know you can redirect them as many times as you want but it just is a mess at that point because they just have really weak task initiation. Organization, if your house is a wreck, if your office is a wreck, if your child's desk at school uh, is a wreck and their backpack is a wreck and their room is a wreck, you know exactly what we mean about organization. Those are the clearest instances I can suggest. And I've got a good question here uh, from AM. It says, I do more of these things than my daughter does. Frown face. How can I help her if I can't even help myself most of the time? And um, I'm going to talk to you about that. Because it's really important that you do help yourself because helping yourself will help your child. And I will get to that. That's a, a sincere uh, and salient question. And it is important, and I will answer that. It's just a little bit further on as we explain uh, how we, what our problems are and how we get there, but I will address that. So you can do assessments too. If you're not really clear where your strong points are and where your weak points are, we have a great assessment. It's called the BRIEF assessment, B-R-I-E-F, right? Um, so it, it's an index there's the IEF, Index of Executive Function. So you can take this and it lets you know it's something you can fill out at home. You fill it out and then it gives us a great idea about where you are in your executive function, how you compare it to a very normal um, brain as compared to some, someone who might have weak executive function. So you can take that uh, assessment. If you're wondering about um, attention, right? We also have an attention uh, assessment that you can take as well. And the reason that you, you could take these is to have an understanding. You know that you have these weak points, but this will clearly define them. It will define where your strengths are and it will define where your weaknesses are. And to have that information rather than just guessing at it, and knowing that I'm unsatisfied or dissatisfied with 
elements of the way that my life is going. This actually makes it a lot clearer. We have those assessments for you. They are not ours. They are independent assessments, but my staff will go over them with you. I think they they run something like $50 a piece to get, and they are not ours. They actually, we have to buy them from another organization, <clears throat> but they are beautiful to take. And then my staff are experts at going through the data and then uh, doing a, an assessment with you. And I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, late, uh, later in the uh, webinar. So let's get to the steps. And this is where AM was talking about her doing things more than her daughter with executive function, having weak executive function. But let's see how we can foster strong executive function. One of the first starting points you should examine is your relationship with a child. And this is directly related to what AM was talking about in her, her chat. One of the earliest, and I'll go through this in more detail in just a little bit, one of the earliest, first, the first way that we begin to learn as a child is called observational learning. I watch the world around me. I watch mom and dad, grandma, grandpa, everyone who comes to the house that I am exposed to. I watch. I learn. And if you think they are not, you're entirely wrong. You, as a parent, are the very first thing, very first input that they learn from. This starts to shape the wiring in their brain very early on, in their formative months, out of the womb, even in the womb. You have some connection where you can start to shape how they are before they come out. Once they enter this world, you are still one of the foremost factors in how you shape them. So having a warm, loving, nurturing relationship is very important to having good, strong executive function. Not speaking to them as if they were an infant, even if they are an infant, you speak in complete sentences. You are shaping how they are going to be. And I know we have a tendency to want to baby them, right? And it's cute, but it doesn't help their brain form. So we form a good relationship. We have talks the best that we can to help them understand the world around them. This is how we start to develop executive function. And I'll go into this in a little bit more detail in a moment. From the relationships in the family and the community, right? So you're number one, when we say you're supporting their efforts, you're supporting the way their brain is being wired, right? What is right? What is wrong? What is acceptable? What is unacceptable? You're shaping that early, early on. You're showing them, you know, that effort is super important, not winning. Winning's nice. And it, sometimes we do win. The effort it takes to get there is what we find important. You model skills for them. Now, AM is saying, I can't model skills because I do this more than I. My daughter does this. And now you can see that she has probably uh, learned some of this from you. And so by improving yourself, you're going to help. And that's why I said, when you learn to improve yourself, you will help her improve as well on two fronts. One is that you are her model. Two, when you improve and she sees that you can improve, she can improve. Do you see the connection? You will engage them in activities that allow them to practice skills. Now, this can be play. How many people here have played Simon Says? Hands raised? Excellent. Yes. That is a great way, even though it's gamification. What skills come out of Simon Says? Listening skills, auditory processing, taking multiple step instruction. That happens. Visual cues, put your hands on your head. Hands on shoulders. Simon Says, put your hands on your head. Simon Says, hands on shoulders. Simon Says, hands on head. Hands on shoulders. Following directions, 
listening carefully, paying attention, transitioning. All of that's included. So we think, wow, these are just good games and they're fun. I used to do them when I was teaching. I was a classroom teacher for many years. I would, on the playground, when we'd go out, I would do these games. Red Rover, Red Light, Green Light, Simon Says was my favorite. And the kids loved it. Absolutely loved it. Because they were playing against every other child in the classroom. And it was rewarding. And they're learning. And they're having a great time. So this is super important for us to realize that this relationship that we're having is not something that's just, um, you know, we're having a little fun here or there. You are their role model. You are teaching them from day one out of the womb. You are guiding them on how to be independent. And you actually are the one that is protecting them and limiting environmental stressors. I really want to say, too, and this is very important, and this is why I ask you to put your phone down. You are a model for your child. And if you have your phone in your hand when you're doing another task in which you need to be paying a lot of attention, whether it's driving, whether it's listening to your child or your spouse or your other, the other kids in your family, and yet you can't pull yourself away from that phone, they're watching. And you can bet by the time they are a teenager, they're going to fall asleep with that phone in their hand. And most likely they'll be texting with a friend at that point, but they'll still fall asleep with it. There is a direct correlation between our use of electronics and our decreased attention spans and decreased executive function. A few years ago, just a few, uh, Microsoft did a study in Canada to find out how long the attention spans of human beings were in general. In general, we have a seven second attention span. Then we have to switch and we'll watch something else. Pay attention for a few seconds. Now that's significantly less than our forebearers. Significantly. In the days of the Lincoln Douglas debates, people would sit for hours listening to just two people debate. It's a problem for us to even hang uh, in a half an hour, 45 minute debate we're watching on TV. Our forebearers, forefathers, forebearers were the folks that could actually pay attention for prolonged periods of time. We don't have that capacity now. And we're teaching ourselves to do it shorter and shorter. By the way, we have a second, seven second attention span. Do you realize how long the attention span is for a goldfish? Goldfish has a nine-second attention span. Now, that tells you something and that's important. We have less attention than a goldfish. So when we're supporting them, right? And this is one of those things I, I had mentioned in the previous slide, support their efforts. Give them praise. Give them praise for the work. Let them know they're not always going to be a winner. And you're not a winner just by showing up. You're there. You give them praise for the work they did to get there. You give them praise for the effort they did, uh, you know, to succeed or complete. If they did win, great. They didn't win, still great. I'm so proud of you for putting in that practice and trying your hardest. Really proud of them. You've got every effort to praise. Make certain it's appropriate, accurate. And then allow them time to discuss with your peers their thoughts on effective study habits. Now, this is something that's a little more abstract, but I think it's important for you to remember that um, when we are looking at this, right, we're discussing with your peers, we're allowing them to engage, to form thoughts about how they are successful in what they do. Most of us take it for granted. 
We just either are success successful or not successful. When we're not successful, we kind of try to examine why we are not successful. But when we are successful, we, we don't think about it much. I'm just successful. But what if I had the opportunity to talk with my friends? I'm successful, you know, because I take the time to look at my the detail when I'm talking to people. And I take the time to listen deeply when I'm in a conversation. I study things like this. And when I try to write my paper, I organize it like this. And so by allowing them to do this, you're allowing them to form the patterns more deeply. And they're expressing it to someone else who may drastically need to hear it. And that's how we learn together. I hope this is making sense. This is the skill model. You can work as they're doing their homework. You can work beside them. If you have work from the office you can do, do it alongside them. Model. If you are using your cell phone at the time that they're doing their work, not such a good idea. Limit screen time. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Do your work alongside your child. Maybe you just are balancing your checkbook while they're doing their homework. Maybe you're creating a grocery list. Maybe you're writing a letter to a friend. Make certain that you do this together because it is modeling. And what is their first form of learning? As is shown in this slide, it is observational learning. And they do that their entire lives. Remember this because it's super, super important. Um, when we're looking at all of this, it's it's super important to understand, vitally important to understand, that they look at mom, dad, and the immediate family and how they behave and how they start to their brain starts to develop. Use a calendar with reminders. If you're using it, they'll start to use it. Be on time as often as possible. If you are at times late, right? You're always tardy then you can expect that your child is learning from this. And they may learn it. Now, if you're late in bringing them to school and the teacher's scolding them, they're going to try to remind you and try to be on time. So it's not a good example for you to make them tardy or for them to try to make excuses for why they're tardy. Be on time yourself as often as possible. Avoid procrastination because if you're procrastinating, your child is going to procrastinate. Talk about how you resolved a particular issue. And this is very important. We're finally talking about how we manage. And because remember, they're learning by listening and watching you. And they're learning. So while we think very little about these things in our daily lives, we have to know that they really are there and our children are watching. Our children are learning. Now, accepting failure graciously. This is a tough one. When you teach them that we learn by making mistakes, and that's how we learn. We learn most soundly when we've made a mistake and something does not work for us. I learned how to fix that. Do I fall apart? Do I have an emotional outburst? Because if you're showing that, then they're, that's, uh, they'll learn that behavior. So you have to learn to accept failure graciously. Let them understand that we all fail at some point and that we learn from these failures and we get better by doing it. I'll give you that example in tennis. Again, not with Nadal. But you can't get better at playing and uh, winning against people who are not as talented as you. You have to play, play people to get better. You have to play people who are better than you. And then you set a higher bar. But that means you're going to fail. But you don't care. You know this is my path to learning to get better. I hope everyone understands that uh, analogy as well. 
So you want to engage them in activities that allow them to practice skills. This is great. I love this. And I still love doing it with kids today. You use board games that involve strategy. All right. Monopoly is great. Kids still love, even though they've got high tech video games, Monopoly is still a great board game. They love cooking with mom or dad. Well, it, it, grandma or grandpa, I measure things. I understand times. I understand organization. I understand I've got to get this in the oven way before because it's going to be late. I won't have it ready by the time everything is done. Right? So all kinds of factors are involved in cooking. And it's fun. It can be very fun. And it can be very helpful. And when you, if you ever watch some of the uh, cooking network where they have the children's challenges, some children are just incredibly talented. They get a passion about cooking. And then when you watch them, it's hard to watch adults go at each other in cooking competitions because they're all so competitive and they have huge egos. When you watch the children cooking, 99% of those children help each other and boost each other. And that is great learning. Talent night. I love talent night. Everyone can do something good, right? Something fun whether it's a magic trick, maybe they're reading a poem, maybe they're showing you their latest dance steps. It's just fun to get together. We are organized. We are learning from each other. We are looking at our successes. We're, and we're talking about, how did you learn that dance step? What brought that on? Where did you get that? So you have a lot of time for interaction and teaching these skills that we keep talking about. Music is a great way to do it. Music requires incredible inter internal discipline to uh, practice the piano or the violin or the flute or the clarinet. It takes a lot of, of uh, good executive function, and it, it actually promotes strong executive function. Magic tricks, of course, as I just mentioned, planning organization is behind every magic trick that you do. Uh, any sports, yoga, martial arts that you can think of typically require uh, and, and, and foster great executive function. So these are all good ways to, uh, to foster good executive function. When you're looking at practicing skills, you, you can teach distributed practice. Now distributed practice uh, is not the typical way that we, we study. Um, when we're learning uh, what we try to do typically, and I think everyone here can probably resonate, this will resonate with each each person here. When I try to uh, uh, learn, study for a test, I will wait till the very last minute. I will cram everything in, right? Cramming, typical way we do it. I'll cram everything in the day, two days before. I'll remember it for the test. Might do okay but then I don't remember it a short time thereafter. That's called cramming. Everyone here identify with cramming? That's the way we usually do it. Okay. So distributed practice is a far better way, and this is evidence-based, that I break it up. So I learn pieces of it. I study pieces of it. And I take a short break between that. Maybe an hour, maybe a day. And then I go back at it but I'm working, working on the same material, but I study it a little bit more. So the brain seems to have that ability once I start studying it and I pay attention to it. Remember, executive function really is governed by overall attention. That is the conductor, right? So when I pay attention to it and I take it in chunks and then I sleep on it, the brain starts to sleep as one of those mechanisms in the brain to help retain memory sleep helps retain memory so i sleep on it i come back this is called distributed practice i really strongly advise you to look at this on the web you'll see many sites that have it and it teaches you how to stretch out the times and how to do it appropriately so we don't stress ourselves to death by cramming but we actually learn material progressively through distributed practice so I strongly advise you to look that up on the web and study it just a bit. 
And this, this is really the breakdown of it. You study material in small increments over a period of time as opposed to cramming. And then you, as their model, can guide them to independence, right? And could be the teacher, could be your minister, your rabbi. Right? It could be any of these folks. Could be coach. Could be grandmother or grandfather. You inspire student motivation for learning. By keeping things fun and exploring. Now, this requires you, as the adult, to plan and organize. So it teaches you those skills and reinforces those skills in you, fosters those skills in you to help them stay motivated for learning. This is a great goal for you. I think AM was talking about how do I do it? Well, you could set up a lesson where you teach a great little fun science project. You can find a million of them on the web that cost very little to do, but they do fantastic things. I used to do one with an empty soda can. You take an empty aluminum can, put just a little bit of water in the bottom of it and heat it up on the stove. When you do, you flip it over into an ice bath. The can immediately implodes because it's air pressure. And when I take all the air out of the can, I put a little water, I boil it, the air is replaced with steam. I flip it into an ice bath, that steam condenses into a little fraction of water, the can has a vacuum, can crushes in front of the kids. They are confounded by why that would happen. But it just opens the door to motivate them to learn about what the heck this is. And it brings up all kinds of uh, different science areas. It's air pressure. And then changing states of matter from a liquid to a gas. All kinds of great things to teach there. So you can help them not only by modeling this and showing them this, but you can have them set up an experiment and you can teach them to develop their plan for learning. This teaches students to also self-assess. You can go over what were your plans? How did you do this? How did you set this up? So they can learn to self-check, self-assess. All of this is can be done with a great deal of fun. Now, as their guardian, or coach, or grandparent, or school teacher, limit environmental stressors. And the number one environmental stressor, if you have a, a home life that is not violent, if you have one that is where parents don't argue in front of the children, if you have one that has limit, limited screen time, you're going to have a life that is going to, to change. And by the way, there is a great article out uh, New York Times just had it. There are several other uh, carriers um, right now, this study out of Japan that showed that early screen use in the first year of life, because now a lot of parents find that the cell phone or tablet is a pacifier. I can put my student, my child in front of this thing, and they are enthralled by the light, by that 60 hertz screen. They will stay with it and uh, play with it. And then we find that they are developmentally delayed in forming certain thoughts in reading and computational and problem solving. It's a mess. So limit screen time. And screen time should be quality time, not junk time, but quality time. And I'm telling you this seriously. We are in a serious dilemma as parents in this world where we are now finding out that um, putting them a screen in front of a child like this actually causes developmental delay. Now, this is a great article. It's out now. You should read it. Read the study. It's a good study. I'll give you, I, I know I'm running a little bit long, but I'll, I'll give you a little of, uh, example of how, this, how the screen influences children. Anybody here familiar with Sesame Street when it was at its peak? Remember Sesame Street? Wow. Okay. That's the majority of us here. All right. So Sesame Street, when it first came out, they paced it. They wanted to get a lot in. So it was a very fast pace. So, you know, the count would come on one, two, three. That's the stereo. That's my best count. Um, it would go very quick. And when the show ended, 
parents were calling in because their children were running all over the house hyperactive. Why? Well, the show was far too fast paced for their minds and it was teaching them to act really fast and hyperactive. Remember, we are wiring. So then says the Sesame Street producers decided, oh, we better slow this down. So now the count would go, when they say, count, how do we do the alphabet? And the count would go, A, B. So it slowed it way down. If you ever watched Fred Rogers, a hero of mine, Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, everything was slow, calm, and we're talking. And he was, he is an expert model. He was an expert model at, at how to deliver concepts to children that are very, very difficult. If you have not watched those shows, go back and watch them. They'll teach you a tremendous amount. Okay, I'm running over, but uh, I do want you to, to go through all these with you. I'm almost through. And play attention. This is why, by the way, I developed play attention so that I could teach these skills. And we do it in a marvelous way. We use a high tech, I'll show you that, a very high tech armband, NASA inspired technology. I actually discovered NASA was training astronauts how to pay attention in states of hyper arousal when they are overly excited and in hypo arousal when they are very bored. And I enhanced that to great play attention to teach executive function. All of the things that we're doing, whether it's visual tracking, time on task, short term memory, uh, oh gosh, discriminatory processing, auditory processing, all of these are executive function and teaching it. This armband, this neurotech armband allows them to control the screen by mind alone so that they're seeing their attention in real time. Attention becomes concrete and controllable, just like this little fellow is doing right here. He's controlling games on the screen. And a uh, few people here are saying, yeah, I've been using this system, which is great. So if you'd like to get those assessments I talked about, simply type in the word assessment into the uh, uh, chat box. We'll make certain that you can uh, uh, get the assessments. Remember, those are about 50 a piece, but it gives you a really good idea of where you stand in your executive function or attention. So that's a good place to start. If you'd like to see play attention in action, um, a live uh, demo, so you can actually see one of my staff members in front of you controlling the screen and working on executive function in real time, uh, just say demo and we'll set up a demo with you on your at your convenience so that you can actually see it happen in real time. And then you can, um, if you want to attend the next Play Attention webinar, please do so. Just go ahead and put in, type in uh, webinar and we will send you a link to the next webinar so you can actually see Play Attention in real time. But if you'd like a personal demo, they'll do a one-on-one -on -one demo with you. We're happy to do it. It's so cool to watch someone wear an armband and and uh, and absolutely control the screen by their attention alone and learn high executive function skills. I greatly appreciate it. I'm Peter Freer, founder and CEO of Play Attention. We are glad that you're here. I hope you found this useful. Remember, you're a model. And it starts there. Take care. Thank you so much.